Part One of Hockheimer of Cincinnati by Fanny Hurst. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Hockenheimer of Cincinnati by Fanny Hurst. When Mound City began to experience the growing pains of a million club, a Louisiana exposition, and a block long public library, she spread westward ho like a giant stretching and flinging out his great legs. When rooming houses and shoe factories began to shove and push into richly curtained brownstone front Pine Street, reluctant papas with urgent wives and still more urgent daughters sold at a loss and bought white stone fronts in restricted West End districts. Subdivisions sprang up overnight. Two-story, two-doored flat buildings, whole ranks and files of them, with square patches of front porch cut in two by dividing railings, marched westward and skirted the restricted districts with the formality of an army flanking. Grand Avenue, once the city's limit, now girded its middle like a loincloth. The middle-aged inhabitant, who could remember it, when it was a cornfield, now beheld full-blasted breweries, cinematograph theaters, ten-story office buildings, old mansions converted into piano salesrooms and millinery emporiums, business colleges, and more full-blasted breweries up and down its length. At Cook Street, which runs into Grand Avenue like a small tributary, a pall of smoke descended thick as a veil, and every morning, from off her second-story window sills, Mrs. Shongut swept tiny dancing balls of soot, and one day Miss Raina Shongut's neat rim of tenderly tended geraniums died of suffocation. Shortly after, the Adolf Shongut Produce Company signed a heavy note and bought out the Mound City Fancy Sausage and Poultry Company at a low figure. The spring following, large to let signs appeared in the second-story windows of the modest house on Cook Street, and, hard-pressed by the approaching first payment of the note and the great iron voice of the Middle West Shoe Company, which backed up against the woodshed, goaded by the no less insistent voice of Mrs. Shongut, whose soot-balls increased, and by Raina, who developed large pores. Shamed by the scorn of a son who had the fingernails and trousers creases of a bank clerk, Adolf Shongut joined the great Pantechnicon procession, Westward Ho, and moved to a flat out on Wasserman Avenue. A six-room and bath, sleeping porch, hot and cold water, built in plate rack, steam heat, hardwood floor, decorated to suit tenant, flat, neatly mounted behind a conservative incline of a front terrace with a square patch of rear lawn that backed imminently into the white stone garages of Kingston Place. Friedrichstrasse, Rue de la Paix. Fifth Avenue, Piccadilly, Princess Street, and Via Nazionale are the highways of the world. Trod in literature, asterisked in guidebooks, and pictured on postal cards, their habits are celebrated. Who does not know that Fifth Avenue is the most Rococo boulevard in the world, and that it drinks its afternoon tea from etched, thin-stemmed glasses? Who does not know that Rue de la Paix runs through more novels than any other paved thoroughfare, and that Piccadilly bobbies have wider chest expansion than the Swiss Guards. Wasserman Avenue has no such renown, but it has its routine, like the history hoary Via Nationale, which daily closes its souvenir shops to seek siesta from two until four, the hours when American tourists are rattling in sightseeing automobiles along the Appian Way. At half-past seven, six mornings in the week, a well-breakfasted procession, morning papers protruding from sack-coat pockets, and toothpicks assiduous, 
hastens down the well-scrubbed front steps of Wasserman Avenue and turns its face toward the sun and the two blocks distant streetcar. At half past seven, six days in the week, the wives of Wasserman Avenue hold their wrappers close up about their throats and poke uncoiffed heads out of doors to godspeed their well-breakfasted spouses. Wasserman Avenue flutters farewell handkerchiefs to its husbands until they turn the corner at Rindley's West End Meat and Vegetable Market. At eventide, Wasserman Avenue greets its husbands with kisses, frankly delivered on its rows of front porches. Do not smile. Gautier wrote about the consolation of the arts, but, after all, he has little enough to say of that cold moment when art leaves off and heart turns to heart. Most of Wasserman Avenue had never read much of Gautier, but it knew the greater truth of the consolation of the hearth. When Mrs. Shongut waved farewell to her husband, that greater truth lay mirrored in her eyes, which followed him until Rindley's West End Meat and Vegetable Market shunted him from view. Mama, come in and close the screen door. You look a sight in that wrapper. Mrs. Shongut withdrew herself from the aperture and turned to the sunshine-flooded mahogany and green velours sitting room. You think that Papa seems so well, Rennie? At breakfast this morning he looks so bad underneath his eyes. Rena yawned in her rocking chair and rustled the morning paper. The horrific caprice of her pores had long since succumbed to the West End balm of Wasserman Avenue. No Raja's seventh daughter of a seventh daughter had cheeks more delicately golden, that fine tinge which is like the glory of sunlight. Now begin, Mama, to find something to worry about. For two months he hasn't had a heart spell. Mrs. Shongut drew a thin-veined hand across her brow. Her narrow shoulders, which were never held straight, dropped even lower, as though from pressure. He don't say much, but I know he worries enough about that second payment coming due in July and only a month and a half off. I tell you, I knew what I was talking about when I never wanted him to buy out the Mound City. I was the one who said we was doing better in little business. Now begin, Mama. I told him he couldn't count on Izzy to stay down in the business with him. I told him Izzy wouldn't spoil his white hands by helping his papa in business. I suppose, Mama, you think Izzy should have stayed down with papa when he could get that job with Uncle Isidore. You know why your Uncle Isidore took Izzy? Because to a strange bookkeeper he has to pay more. Your uncle... Isidore is my own brother, Rennie, but I tell you, he ain't never acted like it. That's what I say. What have we got rich relatives with a banking house for, if Izzy can't start there instead of in Papa's little business? Yeah, yeah, what your Uncle Isidore does for Izzy, wait and see. For his own sister, he never done nothing, and for his own sister's son, he don't do nothing neither. You seen for yourself, if it was not for Aunt Becky, begging him nearly on her knees, how would he have treated us that time with the mortgage? Better, I say, is he should stay with his papa in business, or get out west like he wants, and where he can't keep such fine white hands to gamble with. Miss Shongut slanted deeper until her slim body was a direct hypotenuse to the chair. Honest, Mama, it's a shame the way you look for trouble, and the way you and Papa pick on that boy. Pick? When a boy gambles the roulette and the cards and the horses until... When a boy likes cards and horses and roulette, it isn't so nice. I know, Mama, but it don't need to mean he's a born gambler, does it? Boys have got to sow their wild oats. Yeah, yeah, wild oats. A boy that gambles away his last cent when he knows just the least bit of excitement his father can't stand 
Izzy knows how it goes against his father when he plays. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to look for trouble. I got it. Your papa, with his heart trouble, is enough by itself. Well, we're all careful, ain't we, mamma? Didn't I even holler the other night when I thought I heard a burglar in the dining room? Yeah, how I worry about the things you should know. Mrs. Shongut flung wide the windows and pinned back the lace curtains so that the spring air, cool as water, flowed in. Her daughter sprang to her feet and drew her flimsy wrapper closer about her. Mama, the Solingers don't need to look right in on us from their dining room. Say, I ain't got no time to be stylish for the neighbors. On wash day, I got my housework to do. Honest, Rennie, do you think, instead of laying round, it would hurt you to go back and make the beds a while? Do you think a girl like you ought to got to be told on wash day and with Lizzie in the laundry to help a little with the housework? Do you think, Rennie, it's nice, I ask you? It's early yet, Mama. The housework will keep. Early yet, she says. On Monday, with my girl in the laundry, and you with five shirtwaists in the wash. It's early, she says. Your mother ain't too lazy to start now, let me tell you. Get them Kingston Place ideas out of your head, Rennie. Remember, we don't do nothing but look out on their fine white garages. Remember, business ain't so grand with your papa, neither. Now begin that, Mama. I know it all by heart. I ain't beginning nothing, Rainy. But believe me, it ain't so nice for a girl to have to be told everything. How that little Jeanie Lisman next door helps her mother already. It's a pleasure to see. I, you've told me about her before, Mama. Mrs. Shongut flung a sheet across the upright piano. Give me the broom, Mama. I'll sweep. Sweep, I never said you need to do. It's bad enough I've got to spoil my hands. Go back and wake Izzy up and make the beds. Ah, Mama, let him sleep. He don't have to be down until nine. Nine o'clock nowadays, young men have got to work. Up to five years ago, every morning at dark, your papa was downtown to see the poultry come in. And now at eight o'clock, my son can't be woke up to go to work. Honest, I tell you, times has changed. Mama, the way you pick on that boy. Mrs. Shongut folded both hands atop her broom in a solemn and hieratic gesture. Her face was full of lines, as though time had autographed it many times over in a fine hand. Can you blame me? Can you blame me that I worry about that boy with his wild ways? That a boy like him should gamble away every cent of his salary, except when he wins a little and buys us such nonsenses as bracelets. That a boy who learnt bookkeeping in an expensive business school, and knows that with his papa business ain't so good, shouldn't offer to pay out of his salary a little board. I tell you, Rennie, as he goes now, it can't lead to no good. Sometimes I would do almost anything to get him out west. Not a cent does he offer to. He only makes. You know, Rennie, how little I want his money, but that he shouldn't offer to help out at home a little, that every cent on cards and clothes he should spend. I ask you, is it any reason him and his papa got scenes together until for the neighbors? I'm ashamed. And for Papa's heart, so afraid, that a fine boy like our Izzy should run so wild. Tears lay close to the surface of her voice, and she created a sudden flurry of dust, sweeping with short, swift strokes. Izzy's not so worse. Give me a boy like Izzy any time, to a mollycoddle. He's just throwing off steam now. Just take up with your wild brother against your old parents. Your papa's a young man with no heart trouble and lots of money. He can afford to have a card-playing son what has to have second breakfast alone every morning. Just you side with your brother. Miss Shonka sidestepped the furniture, 
which in the panicky confusion of sweeping was huddled toward the center of the room and threw a cloud of dust to the door every time i open my mouth in this family i put my foot in it i should worry about what isn't my business well one thing i can say me and papa never need to reproach ourselves that we ain't done the right thing by our children clean sheets mamma yes and don't muss up the linen shelves her daughter flitted down a narrow aisle of hallway from the shoulders her thin flowing sleeves floated backward filmy white mrs shongut flung open the screen door and swept a pile of webby dust into the porch and then off on the patch of grass thin spring sunshine lay warm along the neat terraces of wasserman avenue windows were flung wide to the fresh kiss of spring pillows comforters and rugs draped across their sills across the street a negro with an old gunny sack tied apron fashion about his loins turned a garden hose on a stretch of asphalt and swept away the flood with his broom a woman whose hair caught the sunlight like copper avoided the flood and tilted a perambulator on its two rear wheels down the wooden steps of her veranda across the dividing rail of the shongut's porch a child with a strap of school books flung over one shoulder ran down the soft terrace and a woman emerged after her to the topmost step of the veranda holding her checked apron up about her waist and shielding her eyes with one hand genie genie yes'm watch out for the streetcar crossing genie yes'm genie what be sure yeah good morning mrs shanga good morning mrs lisman looks like spring ain't it so i say to mr lisman this morning before he went downtown that he should bring home some grass seed tonight yah yah before you know it now we got hot summer after such a late spring i say to my roscoe that after school today he should bring up the rubber plant out of the cellar that's right use em while they're young mrs lisman when they grow up it's different mrs shongut you should talk only last night i says to my husband i says when i seen miss rainey pass by such a pretty girl i tell you mrs shongut such a pretty girl and such a fine-looking boy you can be proud of ah mrs lisman you think so there ain't one on the street any prettier than miss rainey i tell you if my roscoe was ten years older she could have him i says to my husband mrs shongut leaned forward on her broom handle if i say so myself mrs lisman i got good reasons to have pleasure out of my children i guess you heard mrs lisman what a grand position my izzy has got with his uncle of the isidore flexner banking house bookkeeping in a banking house mrs lisman for a boy like izzy i tell you mrs shongut if you got rich relations it's a help how grand my brother has done for himself mrs lisman such a house he has built on kingston place such a home you can see for yourself mrs lisman how his wife and daughters drive up sometimes in their automobile i'm surprised they don't come more often mrs shongut your rainy and them girls i guess are grand friends yeah and to be in that banking house is a grand start for my boy i always say it can lead to almost anything only i tell him he shouldn't let fine company make him wild ah boys will be boys mrs shongut even now it ain't so easy for me to get make my roscoe to come in off his roller skates at night my genie i can make mind but i tell her when she is old enough to have bows then our troubles begin with her mrs shongut's voice dropped into her throat in the guise of a whisper sometimes mrs lisman when my rainy ain't home i want you should come over and read you some of the letters that girl gets from young men so mad she always gets at me if she knows i talk about them 
Mrs. Shongut, you'll laugh when I tell you, but already in the school my genie gets little notes what the little boys write to her. Mad it makes me like anything, but what can you do when you got a pretty girl? A young man in Peoria, Mrs. Lisman, such beautiful letters he writes, Rainy. Never in my life did I read. Such language, Mrs. Lisman, just like out of a song book. Not a time my Rainy goes out that I don't go right to her desk to read em. That's how beautiful he writes. In Green Springs she met him. Ain't it a pleasure, Mrs. Shongut, to have grand letters like that? Even with my little genie, though it makes me so mad, still I... But do you think my Rainy will have any of them? Not, she says, if they was lined in gold. I guess she got plenty bows. Say, I ain't so blind that I don't see Solly Spitz on your porch every... Solly Spitz! Ah, Mrs. Lisman, believe me, there's nothing to that. My Rainy, since a little child, likes reading and writing like he does. I tell her papa we made a mistake not to keep her in school like she wanted. My genie! She loves learning, that girl. Under her pillow yesterday I found a book of verse about flowers. Where she gets such a mind, Mrs. Lisman, I don't know. But Solly Spitz! Say, we don't want no poets in the family. I should say not, but I guess she gets all the good chances she wants. And more. A young man from Cincinnati. If I tell you his name, right away you know him. Twice her papa brought him out to supper after they had business downtown together. Only twice. And now every week he sends her five pounds. Just think. And such roses, Mrs. Lisman. You seen for yourself when I sent you one the other day. Right in his own hothouse he grows them, Mrs. Lisman. Just think. If I tell you his name, Mrs. Lisman, right away you know his firm. In Cincinnati they say he's got the finest house up on the hill. Musical chairs that play when you sit on them. Twice every week he sends her. Grand! I tell you, I says to her papa, her cousins over in Kingston Place got tickets to take the young men to theaters with, and automobiles to ride them round in. But, if I say so myself, not one of them has better chances than my Rainy, right here in our little flat. Mrs. Lisman folded her arms in a shelf across her bosom, and leaned her ample, uncorseted figure against the railing. I give you right, Mrs. Shongut. Look at Jeanette Bamberger, over on Kingston. Every night, when me and Mr. Lisman used to walk past last summer, Right on her grand front porch, that girl sat alone, like she was glued. I know. Then look at Bertie Shem across the street. Her mother, a poor widow who keeps a rumor, and look how her girl did for herself. Down at Renly's this morning, nothing was fine enough for that Bertie to buy from her table. I tell you, Mrs. Shongut, money ain't everything in this world. I always tell Rainy she can take her place with the best of them. Washing? An hour already my Lizzie has been down in the laundry. Half a day I take Addie to help with the ironing. You should watch her, Mrs. Lisman. She steals soap. They're all alike. Ah, the mailman. Always in my family no one gets letters but my Rainy. Look, Mrs. Lisman, what did I tell you? Another one from Cincinnati. Rainy, Rainy, Mrs. Shongut bustled indoors, leaving her broom indolent against the porch pillar. Rainy, yes, Mama. Letter, feet hurrying down the hall. Letter from Cincinnati, Rainy. Mama, do you have to read the postmarks off my letters? I can read my own mail without any help. How she sasses her mother. Say, for my part. I should worry if you get letters or not. A girl that is afraid to give her mother a little pleasure. Mrs. Shongut made a great show of dragging the room's furniture back into place, unpinning the lace curtains and draping them carefully in their folds. 
drawing chairs across the carpet until the casters squealed, uncovering the piano. At the business of dusting the mantelpiece, she lingered, stealing furtive glances through its mirror. Miss Shonvet ripped open the letter with a hairpin and curled her supple figure in a roomy curve of the divan. Her hair, unloosened, fell in a thick black cascade down her back. Mrs. Shongut redusted the mantel, raising each piece of bric-a-brac carefully, ran her cloth across the piano keys, giving out a discord, straightened the piano cover, repolished the mantelpiece mirror. Her daughter read, blew the envelope open at its ripped end, and inserted the letter. Her eyes, gray as dawn, met her mother's. Well, Rainy, is is he well? Silence. You're afraid, I guess. It gives me a little pleasure if I know what he has to say. A girl gets a letter from a man like Max Hockenheimer, of Cincinnati, and sits like a funeral. Raina unfolded herself from the divan and slid to her feet, slim as a sibyl. I knew it. Knew what? He's coming. Coming? What? He left Cincinnati last night and gets here this morning. This morning? He comes on business, he says, and at five o'clock he stops in at the store and comes home to supper with Papa. Supper, and a regular wash-day meal I got. Tongue, sweet sour, and red cabbage. Rainy, get on your things and... Honest, if it wasn't too late, I would telegraph him I ain't home. Get on your things, Rainy, and go right down to Rinley's for a roast. If you telephone, they don't give you weight. This afternoon I go myself for the vegetables. Excitement purred in Mrs. Shongut's voice. Hurry, Rainy! I'll get Izzy to take me out to supper and to a show. Get on your things, I say, Rainy. I'll call Lizzie upstairs, too. We don't need no wash day with company for supper. Honest, excited like a chicken I get. Hurry, Rainy. Miss Shongut stood quiescent, however, gazing through the lace curtains at the sun-lashed terrace, still soft from the ravages of winter and only faintly green, a flush spread to the tips of her delicate ears. Izzy's got to take me out to supper and a show. I won't stay home. Rainy, you lost your mind? You, a young man like Max Hockenheimer, begins to pay you attentions in earnest. A man that could have any girl in this town he snaps his finger for. A young man what your stuck-up cousins over on Kingston would grab at. You, you, ach, to a man like Max Hockenheimer of Cincinnati. She wants to say she ain't home yet. Him? An old fatty like him? Izzy calls him Old Squash. Izzy says he's the only live cartoon in captivity. Izzy, always Izzy. Believe me, your brother could do better than laying in bed at eight o'clock in the morning to copy after Max Hockenheimer. Always running down Izzy. Money ain't everything. I, I like other things in a man besides money. Always money. Believe me, he has plenty besides money has Max Hockenheimer. He ain't got no time, maybe, for silk socks and pressed pants, but for a fine good man, your papa says, he ain't got no equal. Your brother Izzy, I tell you, could do well to mock after Max Hockenheimer, a man what made himself, a man what built up for himself in Cincinnati, a business in country sausages that is known all over the world. Country sausages! No, he ain't got no time for rhymes like that long-haired Solly Spitz that ain't worth his house room and sits until by the nightshirt I got to hold Papa back from going out and telling him we ain't got no hotel. Max Hockenheimer is a man what's in a legitimate business. Please, Mama, keep quiet about him. I don't care if he... I tell you, the poultry and the sausage businesses maybe ain't up to your fine ideas, but believe me, the poultry business will keep you in shoes and stockings when in the poetry business you can go barefoot. 
All right, Mama, I won't argue. Your papa has had enough business with Max Hockenheimer to know what kind of a man he is, and what kind of a firm. Such a grand man to deal with, papa says, plain as an old shoe, just like he was a salesman instead of the president of his firm. A poor boy he started, and now such a house they say he built for his mother in Avondale on the hill, squashy. I only wish for a month our Izzy had his income. I wouldn't marry him if... Don't be so quick with yourself, Missy. Just because he comes here on a day's business and then comes out to supper with Papa don't mean so much. Don't it? Well, then, if you know more about what's in this letter than I do, I've got no more to say. Mrs. Shongut sat down as though the power to stand had suddenly deserted her limbs. What? What do you mean, Rainy? I'm not so dumb that I... I don't know what a fellow means by a letter like this. Rainy! The lines seemed to fade out of Mrs. Shongut's face, softening it. Rainy, my little Rainy. You don't need to... My little Rainy, me, Mama. I... Rainy, I can't believe it, that such luck should come to us. A man like Max Hockenheimer of Cincinnati, who can give her the greatest happiness, comes for our little girl. I always, like me and Papa, had to struggle, Rainy. In money matters, you won't have to. I tell you, Rainy, nothing makes a woman old so soon. Like a queen, you can sit back in your automobile. Always a man what's good to his mother, like Max Hockenheimer, makes two a grand husband. I want, Rainy, to see your Aunt Becky's and your cousin's faces at the reception. Rainy, I... Mama, you talk like... Oh, you make me so mad. Musical chairs they got in the house, Rainy. What, as soon as you sit on, begin to play. Mrs. Schwartz herself sat on one. And the harder you sit, she says, the louder it plays. Automobiles, a... Uh, a elevator for his mother. Ach, Rainy, I, I feel like all our troubles are over. I, ach, Rainy, you should know how it feels to be a mother. Tears rained frankly down Mrs. Shongut's face, and she smiled through their mist, and her outstretched arms would tremble. Rainy, come to Mama. Miss Shongut, quivering, drew herself beyond their reach. Such talk. Honest, Mama, you you make me ashamed, and mad like anything, too. I wouldn't marry a little old squashy fellow like him if he was worth the mint. Rainy, Rainy. An old fellow, just because he's got money and... Old! Max Hockenheimer ain't more than in his first thirties, and old she calls him. When a man makes himself by hard work, he ain't got time to keep young, with silk socks and creased pants, and hair tonic what smells up my house an hour after Izzy's been gone. It ain't the color of a man's vest, Rainy. It's the color of his heart, underneath it. When Papa was a young man, do you think, if I had looked at the cigar ashes on his vest instead of what was underneath, that I... That talks no use with me, Mama. Rainy, you, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't refuse him. A reply leapt out suddenly, full of fire. It's not me or my feelings you care anything about. Every one but me you think about first. What about me? What about me? I'm the one that's got to do the marrying and live with him. I'm the one you're trying to sell off like I was cattle. I'm the one. I'm the one. Rainy. Yes, sell me off, sell me off like cattle. Tears, blinding, scalding, searing, rushed down her cheeks, and her smooth bosom, where the wrapper fell away to reveal it, heaved with the storm beneath. But you can't sell me, you can't. You can't keep nagging to get me married off. I can get out, but I won't be married out. If I wasn't afraid of Papa, with his heart, I'd tell him so, too. I tell him so now. I won't be married out. I won't be married out. I won't. 
I won't. Mrs. Shongut clasped her cheeks in the vise of her two hands. Married out. She reproaches me yet. A mother that would go through fire for her children's happiness. Always you're making me uncomfortable that I'm not married yet. Not Papa or Izzy, but you. You! Never does one of the girls get engaged that you don't look at me like I was wearing the welcome off the doormat. Listen to my own child talk to me. No wonder you cry so hard, Rainy Shan, got to talk to your mother like that. A girl that I've indulged like you. To sass her mother like that. A man like Max Hockenheimer comes along. A man where the goodness looks out of his face. A man what can give her every comfort. And because he ain't a fine talker like that long-haired Solly Spitz, she, you, leave him out. Anyways, he's got fine feeling for something besides sausages. Is it a crime, Rennie, that I should want so much your happiness? Your papa's getting a old man now, Rennie. I won't always be here, neither. For the love of Mike, what's the row? Can't a fellow get any beauty sleep round this here shebang? What are you two cutting up about? The portieres parted to reveal Mr. Isidore Shongut, pressed, manicured, groomed, shaved, something young about him something conceited his magenta bow tied to a nicety his plush-like hair brushed up and backward after the manner of fashion's latest caprice and smoothing a smooth hand along his smooth jowl morning ma what's the row raining gee it's a swell joint round here for a fellow with nerves what's the row kid Mr. Isidore Shongut made a cigarette and puffed it, curled himself in a deep-seated chair, with his head low and his legs flung high. His sister lay on the divan, with her tearful profile buried, basso relievo, against a green velours cushion, her arms limp and dangling in exhaustion. "'What's the row, Rainy?' "'Nothing.' "'Ah, come out with it. What's the row?' What you sitting there for, Ma, like your luck had turned on you? Ask, ask your sister, Izzy. She can tell you. Smatter, sis. Nothing. Only, only, old, old Hockenheimer's coming to, to supper tonight, Izzy. And old squash? Oh, Willikins. Take me out, Izzy. Take me out anywhere. To a show, or supper, or, or anywhere. But take me out, Izzy. Take me out before he comes. Sure I will. Old Squash Willikins. At five o'clock, Wasserman Avenue emerged in dainty dimity and silk sewing bags. Rocking chairs, tip-tilted against veranda railings, were swung round front face. Greetings, light as rubber balls, bounded from porch to porch. Fine needles flashed through dainty fabrics stretched like drum parchment across embroidery hoops. Young children, shrilling and shouting in the heat of play, darted beneath maternal eyes. Long-legged girls in knee-high skirts strolled up and down the sidewalks, arms intertwined. At 5.30, the sun had got so low that it found out Mrs. Shem in a shady corner of her porch, dazzled her eyes, and flashed teasingly on her needle, so that she crammed her dainty fabric in her sewing bag and crossed the paved street. "'You don't mind, Mrs. Lisman, if I come over on your porch for a while, where it's shady?' "'It's a pleasure, Mrs. Shem. Come right up and have a rocker.' "'Just a few minutes I can stay.' That's a beautiful stitch, Mrs. Shem. When I finish this centerpiece, I start me a dozen doilies, too. I can learn it to you in five minutes, Mrs. Lisman. All my birdies trousseau napkins I did with this Battenberg stitch. Grand. For a poor widow's daughter, Mrs. Lisman, that girl had a trousseau she don't need to be ashamed of. Look, will you? Mrs. Shapiro's coming down her front steps all diked out in a summer silk. 
I guess she goes down to have supper with her husband, since he keeps open evenings. I don't want to say nothing, but I don't think it's so nice. Do you, Mrs. Lisman? The first month, what her mourning for her mother is up, a yellow bird of paradise, as big as a fan she has to have on her hat. Ain't it so? I wish you could see the bird of paradise my birdie bought when her and Simon was in Kansas City on their wedding trip. You can believe me or not, a yard long. How that man spends money on that girl, Mrs. Lisman. Say, when you got it to spend, I always say it's right. He's in a good business and makes good money. You should know how good. The rainy days come to them that save up for them, like us old-fashioned ones, Mrs. Shin. I, look, will you, ain't that Izzy Sean got crossing the street? he comes home from work this early i tell you mrs lisman i don't want to say nothing but i hear things ain't so good with the shanguts so yes i hear since the old man bought out that sausage concern they got their troubles and such a nice woman that's what she needs yet on top of his heart trouble and her girl running round with solly speets and from what she don't say, I can see that boy causes her enough worry with his wild ways. That's what that poor woman needs yet. Look at Izzy, Mrs. Lisman. I bet that boy drinks or something. Look at his face, like a sheet. I tell you, that boy ain't walking up the street straight. Look for yourself, Mrs. Lisman. Ah, his poor mother. A current like electricity that sets a wire humming ran in waves along Mrs. Shin's voice. Look! Oh, oh, I say, ain't that a trouble for that poor woman? When you see other people's trouble, your own ain't so bad. Ain't that awful? Just look at his face. Ain't that a trouble for you? She herself, as much as told me, not a thing does her swell brother over on Kingston do for them. I guess such a job as that boy has got in his banking house he could get from a stranger, too. Shh, Mrs. Lisman, here he comes. Don't let on like we've been talking about him. Speak to him like always. End of part one of Hockheimer of Cincinnati by Fanny Hurst.